Gracious God, be merciful. Oh, my God, be merciful. My soul is crying out to you, my only refuge, Lord, is you, God most Good evening to all who are joining this midweek Lenten service. It is a joy and it is a delight that we can share this time together. I am Pastor Hector Garfias Toledo, and on behalf of the people of Trinity Lutheran Church, God's people serving through this congregation, we want to extend the Lord's welcome to all of you. Tonight and the following Wednesdays, we'll be gathering to sing and to reflect on the healing power and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. You will hear reflections from several members of the congregation who will be uh, helping us to see how faith intersects with our experience and their expertise in connection with health and healing for individuals and for our communities. Also, we will be uh, the worship service. We'll have a Bible study after, after, afterwards, and in that we will Bible study, we'll be able to go deeper in the message for that evening. I encourage you to participate in the way that brings you meaning in your spiritual life. You can sing along. You can follow the melody. You can read the words on the screen, or you can stand or sit comfortably. The most important thing is that we remember that we are united in one spirit in this celebration. I invite you to contact the, 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 the church office if you have any questions, if you need assistance to, to connect or to find the links for the Bible study, or if you need any materials that will help you, or if you need a Lenten bag, one of those kits that are available with devotions and other um, items that will help you to walk this Lenten journey together. And now, as we are coming um, uh, to this uh, Wednesday, first Wednesday in Lent, I want to thank God for each one of you, and I also encourage you to thank God in your prayers for all the people, for all the members, for all the leaders who have put their 
gifts um, to the disposition of God's work in this place to make this worship service possible. Thanks be to God for all of you, and I invite you to prepare now your hearts and your minds as we prepare for this worship and reflection. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face, you who sing creation's story, shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, in the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with one Love that warms the weary soul, love that bursts all chains asunder, set us free and make us whole. You who made the heavens splendor, every dancing star of night, make us shine with gentle justice, let us each reflect your light. Mighty God of all creation, gentle Christ who lights our way, loving spirit of salvation, lead us on to endless day. May God be with you all, and also with you. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright, for your word and your presence are the light of our pathways, and you are the light and life of all creation. Keep watch within me, God, 
deep in my heart, may the light of your heart be burning bright. Arise, let my prayer like incense be poisons, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Praise to the God of all, Creator of life. All praise be to Christ, and the Spirit be to Christ, and the Spirit of life. Let my prayer rise, let my prayer like incense be poisons, the lifting up of my hands as an offering. As we offer him to you. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround us and fill us, so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Good evening. I'm Kirsten Sundberg Lundstrom. I'm thankful that Pastor Hector asked me to speak to you tonight, and I'm grateful to you for being part of this community and for being here tonight as well as we share in our Lenten series. Tonight's devotional focus is on different pictures considering intellectual health. Prolonged times of difficulty can impede our ability to stay creative. The picture of our lives is dulled and hope for a brighter future can fade. We need a touch of inspiration to awaken us from our sleep as we hear in one of this week's healing stories. We also awaken to our agency to seek out the divine healer reaching out to touch the power we know can restore our intellect and imagination. We emerge ready to re-engage with the world, seeking and seeing solutions, creating different pictures of life, renewed, just as a mosaic artist creates beauty from broken pieces of glass. And now a reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 18 to 26. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. I'd like to introduce myself to offer you a bit of context for the reflection on this text that I'm about to give. Many of you have known my family longer than you've known me. My parents, Pastor Paul and Dorinda Sunberg, came to Trinity two decades ago. Although I lived elsewhere in this country for most of my dad's years on staff at Trinity, my husband Nathan and I and our children, Finn and Virginia, always came home here to Linwood in the summers. And during that time, we grew to know this congregation. When we moved back to this area ourselves nine years ago, we became members. I have served at Trinity as a Sunday school teacher for children, teens, and adults. I've helped on various committees and with VBS, and I've participated in the worship team's work on Sunday mornings during service. In my professional life, I am a writer and an English teacher. I've been doing both for just over 20 years, and for the last eight of those years, I've been teaching high school English. This month marks the one year anniversary of the date that my ninth through 12th graders and I became full online learners 
and it is with them, my high schoolers, that I'd like to start tonight's reflection. Imagine with me a Zoom screen divided into 12 boxes. And in each box, imagine the face of a teenager. How's everybody doing today, I ask. 12 faces stare back at me across the divide. Silence. One box goes to black. Okay, I say, we don't have to talk. Just put one word in the chat. Just one word to tell me how you are. I wait. Patience, I've learned, is half the work in a classroom. In a moment, sure enough, a string of words begins to materialize in the chat bar on the right of my screen. I'm tired, one post reads. Lonely, reads another. Meh, says a third in a virtual shrug. One amazingly resilient young man types in all caps, great. The overwhelming majority of my class, however, has confirmed what I can see in their flat, blue light glazed expressions. They are lonely, they are tired, and they are suffering. This Zoom screen is not what I meet every day when I enter my virtual classroom, but it has become more and more typical over the year that my students and I have been learning online. At first, when we began online learning last March, the kids were kind of charmed by the novelty. Learn from home in our pajamas with YouTube in between classes? That doesn't sound so bad. They were resilient COVID warriors. But as our separation from one another has gone on and on and on, I have watched their faces drain, their shoulders fall. They mute their voices. What's left to say now? They turn off their cameras. Why bother being seen? Sometimes I lie awake at night worrying about them. Not the worry I held at the beginning of the pandemic, which was for their physical health, though some of my students have in the last year become sick and some are still battling long COVID symptoms that strike a percentage of all teens who get COVID. My worry now, like so much of our lives and habits, has shape-shifted, and it's much more about the kids' emotional health. Sometimes I think about my own teenage years, about what it was like to be a teenager. I think about the intense delight that I felt meeting my friends at the mall after school just to cruise the food court and hang out, be seen. Sometimes I think about the intense social high of standing on the school lawn with a clutch of other kids, somebody playing whatever song we all liked extra loud on her Walkman with our heads all pressed together so we could hear from her one tiny speaker. Sometimes I think about the intense anticipation I felt sending out my college applications or my first job applications or summer camp applications. I would put them in the mail and think, maybe about my future. What my students miss now is partially the intensity of that connection that you can feel in this moment, right now, as a teenager with your friends. That's a central part of adolescence and they're missing it. But what I worry about more is the painful lack of that maybe, that anticipation of a future that they wonder if they've lost. Who can bet on anything new coming tomorrow if every day for the last year has felt the same? Who can risk the disappointment of hope unfulfilled? Sometimes I worry that my students are in the bowl of the emotional health bell curve the Department of Health psychologists showed my cohort of teachers this winter. Sometimes I think about how when I teach the hero's journey in my literature classes, I talk about this part of the journey using Joseph Campbell's term, the belly of the whale. There in that dark, cold, lonely gut at the bottom of the sea, the hero must simply survive to continue on his journey. The swallowed heroine must just tough her way out. All around her, the roll of the tide rocks her farther from shore and deeper from the surface. Are we there? I ask myself this during the nights when I can't sleep for worry about my kids. Are my kids in the belly of the whale? I'd like to swim out and rescue them. I'd like to find my own boat and oars and row out to them across the waves of our isolation, across the transom of the internet 
and pull them from that dark place and row them back to life before. Back to reassurance, back to the safety of certain solid ground again. If only I could reach them. If only we could reconnect. As I read tonight's scripture from Matthew, I thought about my students. What we have in this passage is really a story about separation and connection. On his way to the deathbed of a child, Jesus finds himself in a crowded street. From out of that crowd, the hemorrhaging woman steps forward and touches his cloak. What does she want? What is she risking in this moment in order to get what she wants? And why does Jesus respond as he does? The woman, the scripture tells us, has been bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. Not only is she likely in real and chronic physical pain, but within her society, she has also become unclean and therefore separated from the daily routines and social interactions of her neighbors and her family. Her physical ailment has become a source of intellectual, social, and emotional isolation. And she is, I can only think, so very, very lonely. She is so lonely, in fact, that she is willing to risk everything just to connect again. In this moment when she enters a crowd and touches Jesus' cloak, she is violating the social mores of her culture. She is making all those she touches in the crowd unclean too. She is making Jesus unclean. For them, that status has real consequences. A period of quarantine, away from their sources of income, from their families, from their own social networks. This woman's loneliness infects everyone she touches, and yet she reaches out anyway. I think we can all understand her, maybe more this year than during any other year's reading of this familiar text. I think we understand this woman's longing for connection, for community, for a chance to escape her own four walls and separation in order to just be part of the world again. What Jesus does for this woman, and later in the story for the child he visits too, is on the surface simple. He sees past the physical constraints that separate them, and he connects. Beneath that simple connection, however, is something much more complex, much more challenging, and it's the work I think scripture is calling us to do. It's the work of moving past our own fears, our own sorrows, our own pain, in order to find ways to see and treat others in their pain with compassion. So let me return you to my Zoom room. On this day, I'm meeting with only four students, and they are all seniors. They have weathered most of this year with admirable energy and resilience, even though this is anything but the senior year they've been waiting for. These students are models of hope. They have sent out their college applications and their internship applications and their summer job queries. They've sent them winging out into the world, into the ether, without any knowledge of whether what they will see next year exists beyond the screen they're still looking at now. They are running their futures on pure faith. But at the same time, on this particular late winter Thursday, they are wilted. They are worn and they are obviously hurting. When I do my weekly check-in, one of them begins to cry. Things are just really hard right now, you know, he says. So we stop class. For the next 45 minutes, all we do is talk. They talk and I listen. And then when it's my turn to talk, I realize I don't know what to say. I can't make this better. I think for a minute, and then I tell them, listen, I can't sugarcoat anything for you. This really, really sucks. I know it, you know it. But I also know it's not going to last forever, even if it feels like it might. Nothing lasts forever. For a minute, as well as being their teacher, I am just another human. We're in this humanness together. And part of what we share is suffering. We share it with all humans everywhere, across all time and culture and belief. But, I tell my students, but. Suffering is not the whole story. It's not the whole human experience. I tell them, I believe we're meant for more than this. 
I believe we're meant for the good stuff about being human too. I think, but I don't say out loud, we're meant for dinner parties that last so long that everyone goes home full and tired and happy. We're meant for hugs with grandparents and cousins and new babies and future love. We're meant for packed concert halls. We're meant for dancing with each other. We're meant for elbows touching as we sit side by side at seminar tables debating our ideas. We're meant for graduation parties in June backyards with all our friends. We are meant to be together, to be connected. We're meant to look one another in the eye, flesh to flesh. And we will do all these things again one day, not so far off, I think, I hope. One day soon, I do believe that we will be back together. I reassure my students, or I try to. I tell them, I care about you. I tell them, I miss having you in class. I tell them, I cannot wait to see you again. Amen.
For peace between nations, for peace between peoples. God have mercy, hold us in love. For us who are gathered to worship and praise you. God have mercy, hold us in love. For all of your servants who live out your gospel. God have mercy. For all those who govern, that justice might guide them. God have mercy, hold us in love. For all those who labor, that justice might guide them. God have mercy, hold us in love. Grant whether that nourishes service to others. God have mercy. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. God have mercy, hold us in love. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy. God have mercy, hold us in love. Help us, comfort us all of our days. Keep us Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness in life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God, praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the Spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Go in peace.